I'm a person who's passionate about God. I am passionate about his word, the Bible, and I'm equally passionate about all of God's people. I try my very best to listen with all of my heart to what God, the Holy Spirit, has to say. And then when the opportunity arises, and I thank Robert for the privilege of speaking today, I share. I am going to say some things today that are challenging, maybe controversial, that will go against some of the narrative that our culture of today is speaking. So I share these words humbly and in love and stating very clearly, these words are for you to listen to, to ponder on, discuss with others, pray about, wrestle with, seek God with all your heart as to what he is trying to say to you through these words into your circumstances, speak into wherever you are at, not what is Sharon trying to say here today. I sense in my spirit that this, is, this word is like a clarion call today as our culture that we live in seems to be a little chaotic, and I think that's an understatement. Foundational truths for people to hold on to are shifting, and truth itself is being challenged. So here we go. What is truth? Where does it come from? Why does it matter? It's always good to start with a definition. The truth is the true facts about something rather than things that have been invented or guessed and words that we're hearing today that seem to associate or battle with truth are misinformation and disinformation. The American Psychological Association tells us that misinformation is false or inaccurate information, getting the facts wrong. Disinformation is false information which is deliberately intended to mislead. Every day we are gathering information that comes from an enormous pool of sources teachers at school and universities, work colleagues, family and friends, TV, newspapers, the biggie, social media, and all the online platforms. Then we decide what we accept or believe, or we dismiss it, or we act on it, we pass it on, or we investigate it further. And as we saw in our clip earlier on, our world today is so very connected. Information travels really quickly, and it's getting harder these days to trust the things we read or see it feels like it's getting harder to know what the truth is. There was an influential French novelist from the 1800s, Gustave Flaubert. Do you like that? Yeah. Uh, and what he said, he made the statement, there is no truth, there is only perception. But I want to categorically say there is truth. Here's one, I'm standing before you, you are sitting in chairs and we are in a building. There is absolutely truth. There was a movie in the 1990s called A Few Good Men that contained a scene where a young lawyer who was played by Tom Cruise is questioning a senior military colonel in the court of law about a decision that this colonel has made. The colonel is played by Jack Nicholson. The courtroom scene is tense, it gets heated, there's a bit of yelling and people talking over one another when Tom Cruise's character is wanting the truth from the colonel. Let's watch it. Why did he have to be transferred? Colonel? Lieutenant Kendrick ordered the code red, didn't he? Because that's what you told Lieutenant Kendrick to do. Object! And when it went bad, you cut country. these guys loose! Your Honor! You had Marcus inside a bony transfer! Your Honor! You doctored the logbook! Damn it, Captain! You coerced the doctor! Consider yourself in contempt! You. Colonel Jessup! Did you order the code red? You don't have to answer that question. I'll answer the question. You want answers? I think I'm entitled. You want answers! I want the truth! You can't handle the truth! And many times after that scene was played, that was the catchphrase in a lot of houses, you can't handle the truth. <laughs> Here's some quotes about truth. <clears throat> Even if you are a minority of one, the truth is still the truth. Gandhi said that. Truth will always be true, regardless of lack of understanding, disbelief or ignorance. I've looked at some of the calculus papers that Taylor's been doing and studying. I haven't got a clue what, they look, what their workings are or what the truth is, but she tells me it's true. Doesn't change the truth just because I don't understand it. Truth without love kills, but love without truth lies. 
As human beings, we usually like the truth if we agree with it or if it positions us in a favourable light. But it's when we hear truth that we don't agree with or it isn't so pleasant that our cells start to react. Parents, we want our children to be truthful. We don't teach children to lie. We don't actually need to because somehow in their little beings, when caught in a situation, they know where the truth might get them into trouble or have consequences they don't like, they lie. And often they lie badly despite the evidence. Let's see what happens to Jack when he gets caught. Hey Jack, did, did you eat a cupcake? No. You didn't eat a cupcake? No, I was not home. You sure you didn't eat a cupcake? No. Hmm. I thought you maybe had a cupcake. No. No? no. Definitely not? No. Not like in the last couple minutes? No. No cupcake for Jack? No. Oh, okay. <laughs> Truth can be confronting. So how do we know what the truth is and why is it important? And I'm not talking about the truths of like calculus and things like that. I'm talking from a Christian's point of view, we would say that the Bible is the foundation and source of truth that we should live by. It is God's word, the scriptures. And just to be clear at the outset, a Christian is not just someone who believes in God. Satan believes in God and I don't define him as a Christian. A Christian has also been referred to as a follower of Jesus. Still correct, but in our culture today, this can have the wrong context because I can follow people and never have met them, and vice versa. There seems to be many celebrations in our house when we get more followers. I can follow Cristiano Ronaldo at the moment and join his 488 million other followers. Or The Rock, Dwayne Johnson, 340 million. Or Beyonce, 280 million. But the person, though, with the most followers, all of those people combined and double it, 2.8 billion, is Jesus. And Jesus knows his followers intimately. Being a Christian is having a relationship with Jesus, which is like a journey. And one of the most important ways for me to get to know him is by reading the Bible. And it's in here that I discover who he is, what he has done for me, and I read about how to live my best life here on earth. We've just had to buy a new oven recently. Thankfully, Mr. Fisher and Paykel, the creator of the oven, gave us a thin but helpful manual, which when we read it, it teaches us how to get the best out of our new oven. We could use our oven without reading this manual. We might burn a few things and we definitely wouldn't get the best out of our oven. We might do okay. But it'll go better for Brad and I if we read the manual. If you don't have a Fisher and Paykel oven, don't use one, don't want one, you will see no reason to read this manual. There's no point every time I come and visit you bringing out my manual and starting to read from page five, trying to get you and convince you to live by my manual. However, if I use my manual to help me with my oven and then I start sharing some of the results with you, now you might be interested. You might think, okay, if that works for Sharon and those are the results, I might just look into it. We might end up having a Fisher and Paykel meeting group to discuss our ovens. (laughs) That was a step too far with the analogy, but I hope you get where I'm going with that. God, the creator of the earth, the designer of you and me, gave us a manual. And by reading it, digesting it, understanding it, and living by it, this is how we have our best, safe, and most fulfilling life on earth. This is his design for everyone. The truth and how to live is found in his word. As we saw in our clip earlier as well in the meeting, there are different thoughts and opinions about the Bible, what it contains. And when people read it, they can filter it through their upbringing, their personal journeys, and what they've been taught. However, the Bible is never meant to be filtered. The whole Bible is given by God, and then it's up to us to learn to read it through the lens of God the creator, with his father's heart. The Bible consists of 66 books written over a time period of 1,500 years. The Old Testament, written predominantly in Hebrew, and the New Testament, predominantly in Greek. The Old Testament uh, speaks to the New Testament, and the New Testament refers back to the Old. There's approximately 40 writers, which consisted of poets, kings, apostles, a doctor, prophets, and it contains letters, 
laments, poetry, genealogies, stories, parables and laws. Reading a few verses from Timothy, different to the ones that Taylor read, but a little bit of context first. So the book of 1 and 2 Timothy was not written by Timothy, but it was written by the great apostle Paul to a young Timothy. It is believed that these are the last letters that Paul ever wrote. He's in prison, he's about to be executed, yet he's sitting writing these last letters to a young man passing on to the next generation. These words, Timothy, my dear child, all scripture is inspired by God and it is useful for teaching, for showing people what is wrong in their lives, for correcting faults and for teaching how to live right. Using the scriptures, the person who serves God will be capable having all that is needed to do every good work. Every scripture inspired by God, one of the last things Paul wanted to remind young Timothy and the next generation of. Every scripture is 100% inspired by God, but 100% written by human beings. And this can be hard to think about. So here's another analogy. So if Christopher Wren, he is acclaimed to be one of the greatest architects of all time. He 100% designed St. Paul's Cathedral, his concept, his plan, and it took 35 years to build. But St. Paul's Cathedral was 100% built by other people's hands. If you've been inside St. Paul's, maybe if you are a musician, you might appreciate the acoustics of the cathedral. The other stuff, it's impressive, but it's the acoustics that speak to you. As an artist, maybe the beauty of the features inside connect. As an engineer, maybe with a logical brain, you appreciate the structure of the building, the detail of how it all works together, but the whole cathedral was designed by one person and every part is equally important and needed. Some of the books of the Bible you might connect with more. You might have some favorite go-to verses. Some parts of the Bible you might question. How can this God that we call love say some of the things that I'm reading in here? How can that be truth? And this is where the understanding and studying of scripture is really important. Who wrote what I'm reading? Who are they writing to? And when they heard it, what would they think? What was the context of when this was written? To be honest, some of the verses I read in here can sound like calculus to me. But that doesn't mean what I'm reading is wrong and therefore can't be true. It's just more my lack of understanding. And I believe it has never been more crucial than to know, to read and understand and study God's word than today. Franklin Graham, the son of the evangelist Billy Graham, he's been in New Zealand recently. And he was interviewed by a news hub. Simon Shepard, the interviewer, asked him, do you think nowadays that your preachings are culturally up to date for Aotearoa 2022? Franklin replied, I'm not trying to be up to date with culture. I'm trying to preach a message that is a 2,000 year old message and it doesn't go by culture. It goes by God's word. Cultures will and do change. The word of God does not. So how can some of the stuff in the Old Testament you say that is still true be relevant? Here's a simplistic explanation which has helped me have more understanding about the first five books of the Bible, the Pentateuch. There's three types of laws that are written for the Israelites included in this book. The ceremonial, the civil, and the moral laws. Ceremonial laws specifically given to the Israelites regarding their worship of God, pointing them to God So once Jesus arrived, the ceremonial laws were no longer needed as such. That's why Matthew records Jesus saying, don't think I've come to destroy the law of Moses or the teaching of the prophets. I've not come to destroy them, but to bring about what they have said. The civil laws, specifically given to help the Israelites in their daily living, their culture, their society would understand the context and these civil laws would make perfect sense. We live in a modern culture with our modern civil laws. To the Israelites, some of our speeding laws might sound random. If they're trying to think about speeding on a motorway with their camels, it doesn't compute. Or imagine in generations to come, reading about some of the civil laws we've lived with in COVID times. If you feel sick, poke a stick up your nose. Put the contents on a white testing strip. And if two red lines pop up, you must lock yourself inside your house for seven days. Don't leave. 
do not go to the supermarket, wear a mask, don't touch your loved ones. All about contents, context and the audience. Civil laws change with culture. Then the moral laws. These are direct commands from God and the Ten Commandments would be included in this. And it's some of these foundational moral laws from the Bible that our culture now sees is out of date. You could say that the church and the culture used to sit quite closely aligned, but over time, culture has shifted with what it finds acceptable. Moral laws have not, and now the church that professes to follow the Bible can get labelled a bunch of bigots and the rest. Paul helps us when we think about moral laws. When he was writing to the Romans, he refers to the Ten Commandments, which were given by God to Moses some 1,400 years prior. Paul says, the law was the only way I could learn what sin meant. I would never have known what it means to want to take something belonging to someone else if the law had not said, you must not want to take your neighbor's things, or thou shalt not covet. And sin has found a way to use that command and cause me to want all kinds of things I should not want. He's essentially saying that without the commandments, the moral foundations, without laws, we cannot know or be convicted of what sin is and its impact on us. We don't know what is wrong, we don't know what is right. In chapter 7 of Book of Romans, he talks about the law being critical to bring us to that point of conviction. He also writes that everyone has sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, and we all need to be made right with God by his grace, which is a free gift. And then we need to be made free from sin through Jesus Christ. This is called our repentance, an acknowledgement of what I have done wrong or the things that are wrong in my life. I ask for forgiveness, and then by God's help and his grace, I learn to live differently. We as a society, we've put measures on sin, and to a point we must. Different sin, different breaking of the law have different consequences. But to God, sin is sin. And I think Jesus tries to make this point even clearer in Matthew chapter 5. Matthew records Jesus as saying, You've heard it said, you shall not commit adultery. And again, he's referring to one of the Ten Commandments. But, says Jesus, I tell you that anyone who looks at a woman lustfully has already committed adultery with her in his heart. Hang on a minute, Jesus. I mean, he just took that to the next level. That is setting the bar really high. Some of the stuff that can go on up here, and that's the point he's trying to get across to all of us. Every person that lives, when we look at our Heavenly Father, all he sees is that blue icing around our face. It is bright. It's obvious. Yet sometimes we think we are so clever at hiding our blue icing. Or I might think the blue icing around my face is not as bad as the blue icing around your face. I judge other people's sins when the Bible clearly tells me not to judge. But what we also see happening now is when confronted with the truth that we don't like, or don't understand, or it goes against what I, self, want, our culture is reacting, it's pushing back, truth is being dismissed, the truth, probably something in this Bible could be called hate speech, even more so, we are deciding what our own truth is, and that's the truth. Taylor read from 2 Timothy that we should continue to follow the teachings we have learned. You know they are true because you trust those who taught you. And it goes on to say, a time will come when people will not listen to true teaching, but will find many more teachers who please them by saying the things they want to hear. They will stop listening to the truth and will begin to follow false stories. Here's some examples. Both of my daughters at primary school were taught by great teachers that the earth came to being solely through gases colliding, the Big Bang. These gases just happen to exist, and then all life has started from there. No other teaching that some people believe God created, God the Creator didn't even get a look in. The very first book of the Bible, the first verse, in the beginning, God created the sky and the earth. 
the truth in God's word dismissed misinformation in my daughter's school. Parents, aunties, uncles, grandparents, family members, do you know what the children in your lives are being taught at school? Be involved, be informed, have input into the lives of children. In a social studies year 10 class, the teacher of matter-of-factly stated to my daughter, because we've obviously evolved from apes, where do our morals come from? Mainstream public school, God doesn't get a mention. Genesis 1, God said, let us make human beings in our image and likeness and let them rule over the fish and the birds and over the animals. God created human beings in his image. If children of this day and age are not going home to family members to hear what the word of God actually says, there will be, and probably already is, a generation of children that have never heard the truth. Truth about their creator, but even more so the truth that they are loved by the creator God, what he has done for them, and what he desires for them. What a devastating and tragic comment that is. Last week, Connor prayed what I believe was an anointed prayer when he said, may this Salvation Army Johnsonville be a place where children are nurtured and go on to be strong followers of Jesus. And we say thank you, Cara Reddish and Sarah Bridal for your teams who input into our youth and children and young adults here. These are hugely emotive topics, so hang on. As I said in my last sermon a couple of years ago, when our youngest daughter signed up to attend her all-girls college, we had six gender options for her to choose from. Have there been people that have struggled with their bodies and with genders they were born into 50, 100,000 years ago? Of course there has been. King Solomon, who's reputed to be one of the wisest kings that ever lived, he says this, all things continue the way they have been since the beginning. What has happened will happen again. There is nothing new here on earth. Someone might say, look, this is new, but really it's always been here. Has our generation become more knowledgeable than the last? Do we understand human brains, nature, and development better? Maybe. Are our biblical scholars now wiser than biblical scholars and theologians from years gone by? God has been in every generation. The one before, the ones to come, he's in the now. He is the alpha and the omega. He is the beginning and the end. God is not in heaven going, oh, here's a surprise. No, he is the creator. There are no surprises for God with his creation. He's not saying, wow, I didn't see that coming. No. The narrative now being shared by some professionals in their field is that babies are born and then assigned a sex at birth because of their genitalia. But as a child grows and develops, if they don't feel comfortable in their assigned cisgender, they can choose what gender they want to identify as. In New Zealand, if a child decides they want to transition from one gender to another, then this can legally start happening by taking prescribed drugs from age 16. This is before a New Zealand child can have a full driver's license. I did write, write vote in an election. This is up for debate. Drink alcohol, get a tattoo. Our society has decided that above these things, our children are mature enough to make the decision to change their gender. In the image of God, he created them. He created them male and female. This has been disputed. We've heard the cry regarding women's rights. It is my body and it is my choice. Another group cries and speaks on behalf of the unborn baby. What about my body and what about my choice? You, God, made my whole being and you formed me in my mother's womb. 2013, New Zealand became the 13th country to allow same-sex couples to marry. Matthew records what Jesus says to the Pharisees when they asked him about divorce. Jesus refers back to Genesis chapter 2, and he doesn't talk about divorce straight away. First of all, he affirms what marriage is. Surely you have read in the scriptures 
When God made the world, he made the male and female. And God said, so a man will leave his father and his mother and be reunited with his wife, and the two will become one body. The Salvation Army affirms that marriage is the voluntary and loving union for life of one man and one woman to the exclusion of all others. And Paul writes to the Hebrews, marriage should be honoured by everyone. The husband and the wife should keep their marriage pure. Marriage, or the covenant of, between a husband and a wife, is the only beautiful framework that God designed for couples to have sex. Our culture today, living together, Saturday night hookups, adultery, sexual sins, normal. Yet it's interesting how our society seems to hold other covenants in higher regard than the covenant of marriage. An example, if we're going to buy a house, until we've signed that covenant, that contract, we have no legal right to it. We can't say, oh, but I am going to buy the house. And one day it will be mine. Everybody knows that. I'm just going to live in it for a while and see how it goes. No, we respect that law, which does make it all the more special when the document is signed when we move in and the law is upheld. As I said, these are really hard and emotive discussions that can divide families and friends and sadly cause division in churches. But these are conversations that are happening around the water cooler at work every day and in our schools and in our universities. And these aren't just topics that we've got to sort out. These are about people, about our family members. These are about our friends that we love, all people, all God's children. And God loves every person in every relationship of every and any gender. The church could be seen as picking and choosing moral laws from the word of God to make an example of before any love has been shown. And maybe the church has been somewhat guilty of preaching truth without love and has caused people to turn away, hurt. In the book of John, we read about a woman who was caught in the act of adultery. And she's dragged to Jesus by the teachers of the law, the Pharisees. She's dragged in the act of adultery. There's a crowd around. Shame on this woman. The Pharisees said to Jesus, Jesus, we've just caught this lady. She's been committing adultery. What are you going to do about it? You know what the law says for Moses. We can stone her. What are you going to do? Jesus looks at them and he says, okay, whichever one of you is without sin, you can throw the first stone. Whoever hasn't got blue icing around their face, you go for it. And the Bible does say it's the older people that start to drop their stones first and walk away. And ultimately there's Jesus with the lady left alone. Jesus says to her, does no one condemn you? She says, no, sir. He said, well, then neither do I. But go and live your life of sin no more. Don't sin anymore. So first he deals with the shame. He gets rid of everybody. Then it's just her and him. And then he speaks love. I don't condemn you. But then he speaks truth. All at the same time. Love with truth. The tension sets in, though, when some say, what I'm doing is not a sin. I'm just living my life how I want, how it feels right for me, and yet the church is trying to uphold what is in God's word. This is tension. Truth without love is harsh. It hurts. It damages any relationship. But equally, love without truth is a lie. The Bible tells us God is love. And God is the Father of Jesus, truth. Both needed in equal measure. The father of lies is Satan. Satan is the father of disinformation. And he is running riot at the moment with his lies here on earth. The thief Satan, he only comes to steal, cheat and destroy. But I, Jesus, have to come that all people will have life in its fullness. And in the book of Daniel, we read this comment. The supervisors and governors tried to find reasons to accuse Daniel about his work, but they could not find anything wrong with him or anything to accuse him because he was trustworthy and not lazy or dishonest. Finally, these men said, we will never find any reason to accuse Daniel unless 
It is about the law of his God. Satan is desperately trying to spread disinformation that God's word, and therefore anyone who lives by it, must be bigoted and judgmental. When in reality, God's word actually contains the greatest love story of redemption. And as we turn our minds to Christmas, so begins the Father's big revealing plan for his children by sending us all the perfect gift, truth. God is the creator. His word does not change. Its context is for all people throughout all generations. If you abide in my word, you are truly my disciples, and you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. Truth is found in God's word, and it matters, because Jesus says, I am the way, I am the truth, and the life, and the only way to the Father is through me. This truth has eternal consequences. So what to do? Peter tells us, live such good holy lives that the people around you will see the things that you do and will give glory to God when the day of Christ comes. Respect Christ as the Holy Lord in your hearts and always be ready to give an answer to anyone who asks you to explain about the hope that you have, but answer in a gentle way and with respect. Last week, Mandy explained that hope has a name and that his name is Jesus. Today we also understand that truth is not a what, but a who, and that is Jesus. And the Bible is the one consistent source that points every person to the truth.